Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, and this is part one of my Bible Poetry New Testament. This will explain why Christ spoke in parables so most people wouldn't understand. A clergyman he spoke right up and told me I was right. His good book was repetitive, that interest was blight. One night he dreamt a dialogue with Jesus Christ and said, You promised us you'd come. You're late. The planet's nearly dead. He answered, I did not say that I'd come to save the day. I meant that if the planet lives, my way would be the way. The parables I spoke make sense to only those who see. To find the answer to my riddles, you must find the key. Get out your Bibles to detect the key which breaks his code. It has been buried deep within another episode. In Matthew chapter 13, 10, it tells where he was asked, why did he speak in parables? So meanings they were masked. Quote, the reason for disguise of message, note the words he said, it all comes down to interest. The theme affects the head. To those who have abundance will be given even more. From those who have, without abundance will be taken from their store. This mathematical equation states the function best. This biblical description of the function interest. To those with spare, the positives, they'll get some extra perks. And those with none, they'll have to pay. That's how the system works. The rich get richer, poor get poorer. It's not brotherhood. It's obvious that interest is reverse Robin Hood, stealing from the poor to give to the rich. This rule of more abundance was repeated down the line in Matthew 13, 12 and 25, verse 29, in Luke 19, verse 26, with 8, 18 as well, in Mark 4, 25, five times Christ used these words for hell. Christ's law of abundance, omitted from the Bible, but in the Gnostic text it's found, the greatest of all Christian laws for economic sound. St. Thomas in verse 95 is where Jesus said it best. If you have money, do not lend it out at interest, but rather give it to one from whom you won't get it back. Thus helping out the poorest saves us from financial lack. So Paul to the Corinthians 2, chapter 8, 14, we find abundance matched to need with charity foreseen. Your own abundance now should be supplying for their need that their abundance later will supply you your own seed. And in this way, who gathers much will not have overfill, and he who gathers little will be taken care of still where people help each other. And in this way, there soon will be a rich equality where people help each other with great productivity. In Paul to the Corinthians, book two does so reveal. In chapter eight, eleven, quote, you must act to match your zeal. So based on what you have, should, you should complete what you began and not on what you do not have to do the most you can. So judge according to your men, materials, and tools, and not according to the lack of money ruling fools. In Matthew 5, verse 42, on credit he did say, From one who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. In Luke 6, 35, he notes the law that we must learn. Of your abundance, lend without expecting its return. In Luke 14, 14, he said, The rich should help the poor. And though you may not be repaid, the Lord will still ensure that when the resurrection of the righteous does take place, you'll be rewarded at that time, you'll get an honored place. For in Acts 20, 35, he tells us to believe, More blessed is it to donate than it is to receive. In Matthew chapter 7, 12, it's hard to misconstrue. Do unto others what you'd like them have do to you. If, while in need, you found the interest to be unjust, refusing to inflict it while in plenty is a must. In Matthew 19.24, he said the lure's too great. A man with plenty can't resist and thereby seals his fate. It's harder for a rich man to get into heaven high than it is for a camel to pass through a needle's eye. 
how interest arises. One tale to show how interest occurs quite easily, especially when humans find themselves in scarcity. A father leaving his estate, his sons he has but four. To each then he gives a sack of seed to grow some more. The first son had misfortune due to natural event, the loss of crop to a tornado, the predicament. The second son he suffered too with locusts in his field. His children soon would starve after an insufficient yield. The third son had a tiny crop, but it was touch and go. He had eight kids who ate most everything he could grow. The fourth son's crop was bountiful. His granaries were full. His brothers asked if some spare seeds might be available. In his right ear he heard advice that he knew to be true. Do help them out, and should you fail, they'll be there helping you. But in his wrong ear he heard words so greedy in their tone. Don't risk security, for your success was all your own. But if you rent your seeds to them and gain from what they reap, you soon won't have to work with interest to earn your keep. At some point in man's history, a brother chose that way, enslaved with debt all of the others, lasting to this day. With slavery and death for those who failed in their reports, it's obvious why Jesus told them to avoid the courts. Luke 12, verse 57 warns the debtor of the trap. You settle with them out of court or you will do the rap. The magistrate will turn you over to the jailers who will keep you chained until you've paid the last penny due. The problem is how long it takes for one who is in jail to earn the money necessary to fulfill his bail. Christ used this clever way to make us see how slavery is caused by debts that have exploded due to usury. In Luke 11:46, he took the time to note the Lord's distaste for the judiciary, and I quote, Woe to you experts in the law! You load the people down. You are no help and burden them with loads that make them frown. You've hid the key of knowledge, and because you did not see, you've been a hindrance to the ones who have ability. In Matthew 12, verse 38, he warns us to watch out for teachers of the law who walk in flowing robes about. They have the most important places in the synagogue, but they devour widows' houses. That's their epilogue. Like Nehemiah, Jesus knew a Lord must set them free and fight the men who had imposed the yoke of slavery. In Luke 4, verse 13, he says, Anointed by the Lord, I preach the good news to the poor, a world they can afford. The prisoners shall be set free, oppressed shall be released. When comes the year of our Lord's favor, you will surely feast. Assault on moneylenders. Abundance had two ancient laws from which he had to choose. Abundance increase for the rich or loans for those who lose. To those who have abundance will be given even more. From those without abundance will be taken from their store. Or your own abundance now should be supplying for their need. That their abundance later will supply you your own seed. In Matthew 4, verse 23, it says in Galilee, He preached the good news of the kingdom for those who would see. He taught the difference in laws for three years under Rome, and then in physical attack he drove his message home. In Matthew 10, 3, 4, he says, My friends, do not suppose that I have come to bring earth peace. That's not the path I chose. I did not come to bring you peace. I came to bring a sword, a revolution for the poor that's worthy of a lord. Luke 12, verse 49 repeats, I've come to bring a fire. To see the earth already lit is to what I aspire. So do you think that I have come to bring you peace on earth? Division is the reason I have come to bet my worth. In Matthew 21, verse 12, the story of his fight. With whip he battled moneylenders. He was not contrite. He set upon the bankers and he caused them all a loss. For busting up their temple's books, they nailed them to their cross. And so you see, Christ did much more than preach the godly way. He stood against the interest and knew his life he'd pay. But we don't have to die like him. He showed another way to fight against the usury, a plan for use today. It's in the parable of Minas, Luke 19.16, and parable of talents, Matthew 25.14, coming up next.